There she is. Hey. So that she can introduce Rebecca. Thank you very much, Kim. Thank you. Hello, everybody. It's so nice to see you today. It's been an incredible presentation so far. I can't believe it's two o'clock already. Um, and here we are with uh, Rebecca McMacken, who is, you know, she's our last speaker of the day, but she is just, I mean, for me, it has been worth the wait. Um, although all the speakers that came before her were quite incredible too. But just to tell you a little bit about Rebecca, um, she is the horticulturalist at the, and a garden designer at Brooklyn Bridge Park in Brooklyn, New York. She manages 85 acres of diverse parkland. It's organically grown um, with an eye toward habitat, creation for birds, butterflies, soil microorganisms. Um, and Brooklyn Bridge Park, it's an it's award-winning peers host top-notch recreation. Um, but the peers also contain native woodlands, freshwater wetlands, salt marshes, numerous meadows. Um, and they closely mimic a native ecosystem that are managed with an emphasis on wildlife. So Rebecca is here today to tell us how she did this um, and to convince us all to go take a trip over to Brooklyn Bridge Park as soon as we can. So Rebecca, I'm gonna hand it over to you and let you get going. And then I will join you again towards the uh, end of your presentation. And we will take some questions from, from our audience. Sounds good. Thanks so much, Kim. And uh, as, as Kim mentioned, yes, please come visit us. Normally, I'm speaking on Zoom to people all over the country, but you all are in New Jersey, so so you can make it over. It's a, it's a wonderful park. Um, and uh, I've been managing it for a decade now. I'm director of horticulture there, and I have I manage a very nerdy and ecology focused crew of 18 people. And I'm, I'm going to talk to you, like all of the other amazing speakers today, about encouraging biodiversity through an ecological gardening practice. And of course, I'll talk a lot about how wonderful Brooklyn Bridge Park is, and make the case for why it's important and even critical that we prioritize habitat for wildlife in our cities and our gardens. But what, what I'm going to spend the most of my time explaining today are specific techniques that we've developed or used at Brooklyn Bridge Park, which we are very much still in the process of learning and experimenting with. But we're at the point now where we figured out some things that work that we can share with other people, as well as the methods that we are using to learn those things, which is arguably more important. So Brooklyn Bridge Park is, hold on, computer, oink, oink. One second, everyone. I'm gonna try and get this to not be frozen. Come on, you. All right, there we go. So Brooklyn Bridge Park is a massive experiment. We're a brand new post-industrial park in the middle of the biggest city in the country. This is Pier 1 out of many. And we're in zone 7B now, which is crazy because when I started, we were in 6A. And New Jersey is really similar. We're so close. It's like essentially the same as far as hardiness zones go. But more important than plant hardiness zones when we're supporting plants and wildlife are ecoregions, which are areas of similar plant, animal, and even geological systems. And there are different levels. So they start broad and then zoom right in. So we're in the same uh, level one ecoregion eight. We're in the eastern central, eastern temperate forest. And uh, we're mostly on the same level two ecoregion, the US coastal plains. But when you get down to level three, we're in 59G, the northern coastal zone in Long Island. And New Jersey is all over the map. I had to turn it sideways so you can see what New Jersey looked like. You have a ton of niche ecosystems that need supporting. And this sort of a thing, looking at these ecoregions, can provide a wonderful scaffold upon which to design gardens. You can find all this information on the EPA's website. And it really becomes important when you're trying to source local ecotype seed or figure out which plant communities we should use in our gardens. We use it all the time in the park. But the point is that many of the techniques that work here um, and many even of the same plants will also work in New Jersey. 
anyway, our park did not start out as a, as a plant community per se. Uh, one of the ways that our park is unique is that it's post-industrial. It's built on reclaimed shipping piers, most of which have an outboard out here and an uplands out here over the water. Um, this is our southernmost pier, Pier 6, closest to the bottom of the screen. Um, and then it goes Pier 5, Pier 4 fell into the water, Pier 3, tier, Pier 2, Pier 1 is up by the Brooklyn Bridge. Then you round the corner into Dumbo and uh, you get Empire Fulton Ferry and uh, Main Street. And then there's even one more section of the park that's out of view. It's an incredibly large park. It's, um, it's the largest public works project in Brooklyn since the days of Olmsted. And after a decade of construction, we finished the park this past December. It's pretty amazing. The park is designed by Michael von Falkenberg and Associates, and before it was a park, it looked like this. It was piers covered in warehouses, and the surrounding community organized to turn that into a park after they fell into disuse. And now it looks like this, which means that everything, all of the plants, all of the soils, everything except for literally one tree was brought onto the site. Certainly, we used as many reclaimed materials as possible from wood from demoed buildings or fill from new subway tunnels in order to make the topography of the park. And we even used granite from bridges in Queens. But what I'd like to impress upon you for the talk today is that the entire thing is constructed. And that's really important for when we talk about ecology. As it turns out, the park has become quite a success. We see 5 million people visit the park between Memorial and Labor Days, sometimes for science events like this star watching evening. We host public art that is genuinely beautiful and engaging, but also a source of constant disturbance and change with construction, with people, and the landscape is always in motion. And in ecology, we call this a disturbance regime. When I said that the park was experimental, I meant that the designers, the contractors, the gardeners were all trying new things. We have bioswales that catch water and recirculate it for irrigation. And these giant sound attenuating berms, which are at one to one grades, as well as the freedom to experiment with unusual strategies when our berms get covered in thistle. But the point is that we're all experimenting and learning together. As you saw before, the park is quite large. It's officially 85 acres, which includes well over 16 acres of garden bed, which doesn't count turf, which is a lot more than a full acre of garden space for each of the park's 12 gardeners to manage. So the level of care that each bed gets is really different from other more manicured parks or gardens. And so it's good that we're also super wild. And with rare exception, we don't really have gardens. The beds are more architectural. They block wind and create spaces. They define views. And they're planted in ways that allow city people to have the experience of exploring a woodland path in a safe and accessible space. The beds are really beautiful, but it's rare that someone would look directly at them. The vast majority are essentially ornamental thickets, but that is not bad at all because their density makes them perfect habitat for migratory and nesting birds. Birds will look first for structure and then for food availability when selecting a place to forage or nest, and our beds are perfect. And that's important when you look at where we're located. Look at all that green around the city, and then look at the gray around New York City and Manhattan. And you can zoom in and see that there's even less green as you zoom in. You see these large green patches and those are large city parks, Central Park, Prospect Park. Um, and we wanna be another big patch of green. Um, and that's really important. We need as many of those big patches of green as possible because of where we are located and where New Jersey is located, which is the East Atlantic flyway for bird migration. These are animals whose populations are often in decline due to habitat destruction. I'm sure you all saw the report a couple of years ago that bird populations in North America are down 30% in the last 50 years. That's almost 3 billion birds just gone. And with that, urban development is on the rise. Currently, more than half of humanity live in cities. But that number is expected to reach almost two thirds by 2050, when the UN predicts the world population to hit 9.8 billion people. So it's imperative that we figure out ways to fit these animals and their migrations into our cities. And we take the responsibility of figuring out how to do that really seriously at Brooklyn Bridge Park. The park is managed first and foremost for people though. And even on the Hort team, we prioritize the connections that we facilitate between people and the landscape. There are many sports fields and courts. 
The park offers the ability to not only be near the water, but to get into it and explore the amazing animals who live in the water just outside Manhattan. Sometimes our aquatic neighbors even visit us. This is a harbor seal who swam up on the dock two years ago. It was amazing. But in addition to all of that, we strive to facilitate our visitors' meaningful interactions with nature, whether intentional or spontaneous, as well as manage our garden beds with the express purpose of fostering biodiversity. The park is made up mostly, but not exclusively, of native plants. We use only organic management strategies, and we specifically seek through research and experimentation to manage garden spaces as wildlife habitat to the best of our ability. And as I mentioned, we don't really have garden beds, so we refer to areas of plants that have specific environmental requirements as ecosystems. And it sounds a bit hokey, but it's really the best word to describe an area like a salt marsh, which we have three of or our freshwater wetlands that run the length of the park and are filled with emergent aquatic plants. We also have what we call ornamental ecosystems, which are made up of plants tough enough for playgrounds, but familiar enough for park entrances. They kind of welcome people into the park and then we get a little more wild once you get into the park. We have massive wet meadows and tiny dry meadows. We have a lot of meadows. We have over five acres of meadows in the park that are constantly changing. This one was um, in a playground and the idea we planted it with the idea that kids could frolic through the grasses and we opened it and it was destroyed by the kids in like two months, um, sadly. But the majority of the park uh, is not meadow. The, uh, the majority of the park is comprised of this woodland edge plant mix that we call the dense hedgerow. And when it was originally planted, it was a bunch of tiny trees and sun-loving perennials, which grew and grew and continued to grow and eventually just completely shaded out all of the sun plants. And we've essentially replanted the entire understory of the park, which has been a total pleasure. We use a lot of surprisingly rough and tumble spring ephemerals like Virginia bluebells and celandine poppy, which is this big time thug in the park. It runs around like crazy and others that are quite delicate and could never have been planted originally, like this ruin enemy. They have to be grown by caring people. And that's really a massive part of our work, which is taking all these placed plants and turning them into mature or maturing landscapes. But the way we manage them is a very different style of gardening than traditional, traditional formal horticulture, which always seems intent on telling plants what to do. In traditional horticulture, when a shrub or a tree is placed somewhere, it's most often with the expectation that one could return in 50 years and see it just as people left it, but possibly larger. In our landscapes, we allow for movement and growth. We even allow for plants to die. We see our beds more as systems that the Hort team is trying to kickstart so that the natural cycles of the plants can take over and become more or less self-sustaining or at least self-regenerating, especially given the park disturbance. And that for us really starts with the soil. Our soils are all engineered which means that contractors will take specific percentages of sand, silt, and clay and add compost and voila, you have soil. Um, there, we have over 20 different soil profiles in the park. Most of them are designed by the absolutely brilliant uh, New Jersey native T. Fleischer. But the reality is that they are not real soils. They lack the structure and biology and processes that create a living soil. And urban soils have the added stressors of compaction and salts, sometimes synthetic materials. So it's our job to turn these mixed ingredients into real soils, but they're not so that they're not just holding plants upright. So they need to actually break down material and cycle nutrients. So one of the main tools that we use in order to do that are the plants themselves. The leave the leaves movement is so important for so many reasons. Leaves are obviously a better mulch than anything you can buy in a bag. They're what your plants want to grow in. Your plants literally put them there to grow in. And there's this funny idea floating around that deciduous trees will throw their leaves away in the winter. But the reality is that they're carefully placing them over their roots where they will break down and soil microorganisms can recycle and reintegrate those nutrients over the next season, like a slow motion carbon fountain out from the tree, back into the soil, back up into the tree again. Those leaves provide starches and complex molecules. They feed the microorganisms that feed the plants. 
and the plants are using the leaves to build the soils that they want to live in. A lot of gardeners have it backwards. The plants are making the soils for us rather than the other way around. If you think about a, a juniper in the middle of a meadow, um, and uh, it's, you know, it's an early successional plant. It's out in the meadow where a lot of woody plants can't live. And you dig a hole right underneath that juniper. You're going to find soil pHs orders of magnitude more acidic than even just 10 feet away. And that is because that juniper is terraforming the soil, creating an environment that it wants to live in and is then more conducive for all of the other, other woody plants to come in. It's using root exudates. It's using needle castings in order to change the pH microbial composition and structure even of the soil and create the soils for itself and then for us as well. So we at the park are actively looking for ways to leave the leaves and to not disrupt these processes that the plants are working really hard to do. We don't want to get in the way. We trust them to know how to create the environment that they want to grow in. And we are always looking for ways that we can get out of the way of their, of their cycles. So in our park, this is what it looks like in the winter, and it totally fits for us. In a more formal environment, a foot or two of mulch on the front edge can clean it all up. Um, when you keep your garden uh, you know, front uh, really neat, this is what Mount Cuba calls a cue to care of care. And then you can get away with a lot of benign neglect in the rest, we call it. We like to think of it as sort of like a mullet where you keep the, keep the front really neat, back can be a little bit wild. Um, and it's healthier for the plants because the leaves are a weed suppressant and a temperature buffer, um, but it's still a lot, of, a lot of work, right? It's not no maintenance because when we get certain pests or diseases, we have to clean out the duff in just those areas, which involves mapping and thinking. So it's work, it's just different work. I still think it's less work, but it's just different work. And it doesn't work everywhere. Um, in certain areas, the soils are too new to cycle nutrients and break down leaves. And so we do need to remove leaves from those areas. And in other areas, we manage the park entrances, for instance, as more formal spaces. And so in those areas, we rake out all the duff and mulch those areas like in traditional formal horticulture. So we're always just looking for places where this stuff can fit in. And we make sure to do it wherever we can because the leaves are really critical for plant health, but plant health, but they're also really necessary for wildlife. During winter, as Don was saying, within many of that duff layer of leaf litter um, live many of your overwintering insects and other wildlife. Beetles, bumblebees, butterflies, and moths all live in this layer of trapped heat that the leaves will enclose in winter, and it's called the subnivian zone under the snow. The earth, the heat of the earth, will melt the snow that's right against it. And then the twigs and leaves hold up this little icy ceiling of snow. And if that snow layer gets to be six inches deep, the space beneath it against the earth literally doesn't get below freezing. It's this warm little place where a lot of organisms have organized their winter life cycles. Duff, and this, I think, is a fantastic picture of this, of this illustrated in the park. Um, on the right side of this picture is a weedy mess. Um, this is one of our berms that got in take over by weeds. And on the left side of this picture is a native fescue sod that we put down after solarizing and an attempt to reclaim the land um, from weeds. But it is an interesting illustration of the extent to which that native plants are not the end all be all of habitat gardening, right? It's not just about planting the plant. Plants provide structure as well as, you know, the chemicals that are in their leaves and, um, and pollen uh, and nectar for, for animals. They provide structure that creates habitat. And so if you're looking at these two sides of this berm, which side would you want to be on if you were a beetle? Would it be the weedy mass where you could be under the snow and crawling through leaves and twigs? Or would it be on the side of, of fescues where it's just a blank slate and snow can't even stick to it? Um, and so I think that this really illustrates really well the extent to which we need to consider structure in our gardens when we think about habitat. And of course, not cut back and keep things messy as everyone else has been saying over and over again. Because when you clean it away, you've literally raked out a bunch of animals. And that's one of the big differences, right, between organic gardening and permaculture and then ecological horticulture. Because in ecological horticulture, we're looking at specific animals in the park 
and then organizing our garden practices around their life cycles wherever possible. So duff layer overwinters that we've seen in the park are, um, of course, bumblebees, um, as well as morning cloaks. They're one of our first butterflies of spring because they overwinter as adults. This giant polyphemus moth that overwinters as a cocoon that is a dead ringer for a leaf. You would never be able to differentiate it. And this little pearl crescent that Don mentioned as well, who overwinters as a caterpillar under the evergreen leaves of their host plant, the smooth aster and some other asters as well. And so when we do cut back, we make sure not to step at the base of the asters. And then there's a bunch of birds like this oven bird who only hang out on our land when there's duff to root around in and insects within it. The same thing with the swamp sparrow. It's like we're growing these plants to attract insects and growing the insects to attract the birds. And that's important because more than 95% of terrestrial bird species in the US feed their young exclusively on insects. And if you've read any of the reports coming out about the pre precipitous decline of insect populations, you'll understand why this is so important. Globally, in the last 35 years, entomologists estimate that we've seen an arthropod decrease by 45%, and local studies are much worse. But generally, over the course of the entire world, that's almost half of insects gone in, in 35 years. It's absolutely wild. And two years ago, a German study in a forest found that flying insects were down 76%. And a recent study in Puerto Rico found that they had lost 60% of their insect population, along with 50 to 60% of insectivorous animals. They think that one is due to climate change. So who knows, honestly, if anything is going to help at this point. But we're going to try, to the best of our ability, to sustain these ecosystems and even build them when we have to. Because as things get more developed, this work is just gonna become more necessary. And I'm really glad that we have help in that endeavor because as much as I would love to be able to tell you that I could tell those two brown birds apart, much less describe their foraging behavior, I absolutely cannot. This is Heather and she's our resident birder who actually published a book of the 180 birds that she's seen in our park. And she tells us not only when uh, not only which species of birds visit the park, but also where they go, when they come, what they're doing. And then we use that information to support the birds. For example, we knew that a certain hill was incredibly popular with fall migratory birds for the goldenrod seeds. And so we were able to add a bunch of beautyberry to make sure that there was fruit there as well. But at her suggestion, we planted it after the birds left so that we didn't disturb their migration. So now each spring, um, and possibly next week, actually, we do a walk with Heather to get sort of the state of birds in the park. And then we translate that information into our cutback strategy and schedule. So for instance, last year, Heather identified an area where she saw white-throated sparrows trying to nest which was really important because they've never nested in New York City before. And so we looked at that whole area of the Berman, we just left it alone. We didn't get, go in there to cut back. We didn't weed, we just left those, those birds alone. And sadly it didn't work. We don't think that they nested, but we tried, right? We're going to always try stuff like that. And the point here is that we're not just planting native plants or planting plant for birds. We're looking at the species who use the park and how they're using the park and then bolstering those resources or just giving them space wherever we can. And again, this is what we mean by ecological horticulture. Certainly it's planting the right plants, which for us means the vast majority of native plants really loosely defined. But there's still this really funny idea floating around that cities are so different than any native ecosystem that only the most aggressive exotics and invasive plants could possibly live here. And I just think that's hilarious because we work with these plants every day and see things like honey locust and panicum not only thrive, but really outcompete weeds. Last spring, when the park uh, most park employees uh, were sent home due to COVID, we made these extensive databases of native plants that thrive in urban conditions, and we posted them on our website, which I'll have a link to at the end. But the point here is that ecological horticulture is more than planting a native plant and walking away. It's about the relationships that those plants have with other organisms. If you think about a coneflower surrounded by a foot of mulch in your average garden, it's like an animal living in a zoo. It's not really an integral part of anything. It needs pollinator partners and nectar robbers, and seed distributors, all of those things. It's about the dynamics among the plants and the animals. 
and at the park, you know, we're leave the seed heads up for birds throughout the winter. And that's a practice which is thankfully aesthetically acceptable, even in formal gardens right now. It's wonderful to see how fast that's changed. But we also try to leave our seed heads up for birds in the spring for their migratory flights back through the area. That's when a lot of these seeds are getting eaten when birds fly back through. So in certain areas, we push cut back as late as we can. And then in other areas where Heather and others think that the birds might actually nest, we cut those areas back early so that we're not disturbing areas and scaring birds away. It's, more, it's a lot more complicated than just cut everything back after temps hit 55 degrees. Those sorts of statements make great Facebook memes. And it's honestly like incredible that techniques to support animals are going viral on Facebook. It's like the most wonderful, wonderful thing. And it really gets people thinking in the right direction. But what we're doing here at our park is trying to foster real observation and connection and relationships that can then adapt and evolve rather than static rules. Given the extent to which our climate, our landscape consistently changes, we need to be able to constantly change our gardening practices as well. So when we do do cut back, we inspect our seed heads and see which plants have viable seeds in them. And then we cut those seed heads off and leave them on the ground so that other animals can still eat them or they seed in and help the seed bank. And that sounds really labor intensive, but we've gotten really fast at it and it's not hard to do. We found that asters and goldenrods and their relatives relatives maintain most of their seeds, which makes sense as both Xerxes Society and the Audubon put asters and goldenrods at the tops of their lists for beneficial plants for both birds and pollinators. And if you don't want to or can't leave duff in your garden beds, you can still cut viable and pretty seed heads and stick them back in the soil after cutback. This is in my garden. We don't actually do this in the park, but I just think it's pretty. And it also allows if there's a late snowfall, those seed heads can stay above the snow so that they're still available for birds. I call it a bird bouquet. And this is our new big idea, which is don't cut back at all. A lot of our horticultural practices we've learned to do just because it's what other people did. And often those other people lived in England 400 years ago and kept topiary. So we try now to interrogate traditional garden practices and ask why these things are necessary. Certainly some things really do need to get cut back for cleanliness or safety, or it really just looks a lot better. But where we can, it really benefits everyone to find areas that we can leave untouched like the backs of beds or places that already look really pretty like hedgerows. We found that things like sedges, like in the, in the lower section of this photo, this is the fox sedge, they never need to get cut back. They actually look really awkward when you cut them back. And we wanna normalize this. We wanna make this an acceptable garden aesthetic. It took Pete O'Dolph to get people to appreciate leaving seed heads up in the winter. And it's arguably taken all of Europe making gardens out of North American native plants to get most North American gardeners to love what grows here. Our goal is to make people appreciate what the landscape looks like naturally. And yes, this is a really intentional and curated natural aesthetic, but it can still serve the purpose of shifting people's perspectives of this as from messy and neglected to acceptable or even beautiful. And then that allows us to have gardens that can function as habitat essentially by being left alone. I read a paper out of New Jersey a couple of years ago, sorry, not New Jersey, St. Louis, on how the income of neighborhoods can affect pollinator abundance. They found that the less money that people had, the more pollinators they had, because the people with less money were not managing their landscapes. They weren't gardening. They weren't disturbing their land. So knowing this, are we going to let the entire park go and not cut back anything? Not at all. We are going to do our jobs but we do look for places that we can add in pockets of minimal disturbance. And amazing things can happen when you just let things go. Um, this is in the flower field. I'm gonna talk about the flower field quite a bit. Um, but the gardener for this area of the flower field, uh, her name is Bella. And we were talking about this idea of minimizing cutback. And she came to me with some research. Uh, she found that uh, the rose mallow, Hibiscus mishudos, supports over, I think it was like multi dozens of species of lepidopterans, of birds and mo of um, moths and butterflies. And um, 
And many of them, she thought, uh, were burrowing into the stems. And so she wanted to leave the stems up. And I said, you know what, Bella, this is actually not going to work out. I'm worried that this is crossing the line. It's going to look a little too messy in the garden. And um, she said, just let me try. And what she did was to clean out a lot of the broken stems or crossing stems and leave this beautiful silver scaffolding up in the garden. And I was stunned. I think even when you don't consider the ecological elements of something like this, this is beautiful. It's evocative. It makes us question our normal gardening practices of just green and flower in the spring, which is, is not really a natural aesthetic at all. So I just absolutely love this. I think it's a huge success. And she found, when she first started doing this, a song sparrow nest at the base within those stems of the, of the hibiscus that would not have been able to be placed there if she had cut everything back. And so even more precious than these tiny little eggs are these little baby song sparrows that were hopping around right around her garden just a few weeks later. And because of that gardening practice, right, we're trying to draw these lines directly from these beautiful and also wild gardening practices over into providing spaces for these baby birds to live in the park. And this is a red-winged blackbird mama, um, and she is sitting on a milkweed stem that another gardener, Pavel, did not cut back in his zone, the Pure One Wetlands. And it looked terrible. It was a wild mess. I did not like the way it looked. And I said, Pavel, you've got to cut this back. This is, you know, again, crossing the line. We want to keep people happy and, and make them know that this is not neglected land. And he sent me this video um, just a few weeks later. And so this is this mama red winged blackbird, which was a huge victory to get these birds to nest in our park. And she's stripping the fibers from the milkweed in order to go build her nest in the park. And just a bit of research showed me that the fibers on milkweed stems are actually renowned among birds for their nest building capacity. Things like orioles with really structural nests will use milkweed of all species in order to build out those nests. So knowing that, why would you cut your milkweed back? Why would you take that important resource for those birds? And yes, maybe it's not the front of the bed. Maybe it's not a formal border where you, um, where you leave your milkweed stems up, but I'm sure we all have spaces in our gardens where we can leave these things up uh, for the wildlife. A few years ago, uh, this weedy aster showed up in our park and I didn't know what it was and it was non-ornamental and I almost had the crew pull it out, but I posted it online to get an identification and lo and behold, it is the state threatened salt marsh aster, which we've now moved to our salt marshes where it is actually thriving. And this is one of the older gardeners in the park. This is John and he's holding a Katie did and they make the ch -ch 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 sounds that you hear at night. And they lay their eggs on twigs and perennial stems that we leave on the ground. And this is a differential grasshopper that calls in our grasslands. And we didn't used to have these animals and we honestly didn't even know that we were missing them. But one day the grasshopper started calling and the crickets started singing and we had the katydids at night and it just completely transformed the park. Because the animals are an integral part of the park experience for people. They give us those auditory cues that trigger relaxation or memory. And they say, this is what a summer night sounds like. We practice a lot of the more well-known strategies to attract wildlife as well. We plant the earliest flowering plants that we can find like this pussy willow or Carolina silverbell. They do the critical job of providing food for awakening queen bumblebees. We plant the late flooming late blooming flowers as well to provide pollen and nectar for insects preparing to overwinter. Like those same queen bumblebees, it's actually really important. 30% of bumblebees don't make it through the winter because they don't have enough food. This is Aster Radon's favorite and it's the latest blooming flower in the whole park. Each year we're always looking for that latest flower. And this beautiful area is called the dunes and it has five species of goldenrod, all native to Long Island. We plant plenty of berries um, for the birds who overwinter with us in the park, like winterberry and bayberry. <clears throat> and John, before he left, he was drilling holes in wood um, for bees like this leaf cutter. And we leave a lot of rotting stumps and snags in the beds. <clears throat> and we always try and hide them or make them look beautiful. And after, you know, this park is 10 years old, we didn't have a lot of insects when it started, but we've now started seeing bees, like these wonderful little um, metallic, 
uh, bees called Aguacora pura that nest in rotting wood. Because we didn't have rotting wood, we couldn't provide a home for them. But now over time, we're starting to see them move into the park and it's really exciting. But of course, building up all of this biodiversity brings in wildlife that we don't want as well. These are oleander aphids who came in on imported oleander and then jumped out to go after our native milkweed. It's really unfortunate. But how we deal with this pest, this really common garden pest, is another big difference between traditional organic gardening and then, of course, ecological horticulture. Because rather than try to maintain a sterile environment, which is what you learn when you go to horticulture school, um, which is and also is totally impossible anyways, what we do is we seek to build up biology to the point that pests will stay in check. It's kind of a balance, right? We're not trying to eradicate anything. We're just keeping things in check. So when you think about it, if you plant a plant, you've created a vacuum. There's a resource there for herbivores and they're gonna eat, um, the herbivores are gonna eat your plants. That's what they do. And then it's gonna take a while for the predators to come in and find those herbivores and then start eating the herbivores and then managing their populations. But if you keep wiping out the herbivores, you never get to that point. Um, we used to work with this incredible woman named Fran Reedy, and she said that the predators would always notice the aphids around the same time that people noticed the aphids. And so we were just constantly shooting ourselves in the foot trying to, um, trying to wipe them out. And so, and what you'll notice in this picture, if you look down towards the bottom of the screen, there's those two large brown aphids and they are aphid mummies. And they have a, a parasitic wasp developing inside them. And in just a few days, that wasp is going to hatch out and then mate and then lay their eggs in many, many more dozens upon dozens of other aphids. And through that strategy, keep the aphids really in check. This is me standing in a patch of swamp milkweed a few years ago, just with my iPhone and taking photos of all the beneficial insects that were around us. So from left to right, that is lacewing eggs, lacewing larvae, flower fly larvae, and then ladybug larvae. And if we are using even horticultural oils, we're wiping out all those guys as well. So we really try to not do anything wherever possible. But I mean, sometimes we have to, but it's very, very rare that we'll take that intervention. In the past, we also used to do selective releases of animals, but we don't really do those at all anymore. Um, there's a lot of issues with spreading disease and even invasive species or harming wild populations of things. So we really try and attract in beneficial insects rather than releasing them. And some issues we just don't have the tools to solve, like this is cedar quince rust and it's on our surface berries. And we can't really do anything about it. So we just have to practice tough love. I it just, it's part of our park, it's part of the ecosystem here. And some plants will die because they get scale infestation or something like that. And that's fine. We don't wanna keep our plants on life support forever. That's not what we're trying to do here. And our thresholds are sky high. And that's wonderful. I have the luxury of convincing myself that these Taxodium midge galls are actually very beautiful. And they tell a story. They allow us to tell the story of the landscape. And we've had great successes with these strategies so far. This is one of our many catalpa trees and it gets absolutely covered with aphids in the summer. And we were originally encouraged to spray them, but of course did not. And one day after telling a bunch of volunteers about the various ladybugs of New York, one of them leaves this on my desk. And it's the two spotted lady beetle. And it hadn't been seen in New York state in 30 years. And now I'm happy to say that we have them all over the park and they seem pretty stable. And the thing about this beetle is that it's teeny tiny when you compare it to other lady beetles and it eats these teeny tiny aphids. And if we had sprayed the catalpa trees for the aphids, we would have wiped out the lady beetles. And so this really illustrates why tolerating a certain level of pests is so critical. But we also do more experimental work to attract wildlife. Much of it happens in this, which is that flower field. It's essentially, it's entirely native wildflowers and it's arguably one of our only real gardens in the park. It's a half acre, which is great because there's a high edge to area ratio. And that means that animals can get away from us, which is really critical for things like ground nesting birds. They really don't wanna be around people. 
And it has these massive swaths of flowers, which are wonderful for attracting butterflies to drink nectar from. But we also have butterfly host plants in large numbers. And that's important because butterflies can pick up the volatile compounds from their host plants from really far away. So monarch can tell not only that you've planted milkweed in your garden, but they can also tell how much you have. And given that we have thousands of square feet of swamp milkweed, we have thousands of monarchs in a good year. And we get these just clouds of monarchs in a good year as a result. It's really extravagant. Um, it hasn't been a good year since 2018, unfortunately. They still come through the park, but it's, it's absolutely heartbreaking to see how low the migrations are. But I love this picture. I love this picture so much because it shows this supposed juxtaposition of the Manhattan skyline and this really high functioning monarch habitat. And it shows how easy it can be to integrate these things. Because our monarchs are not just stopping by for a drink of nectar, they're breeding in the park and we're supporting them. And to do that, one of the really important things in order to do that is to make sure that the milkweed was not grown with systemic insecticides, which would kill them. And it's amazing how hard it can be to find butterfly host plants that are, do not have systemic insecticides like neonicotinoids. They will literally, they're put in the plants that can't be washed off. They are put in there to kill insects. And when you put them in their landscapes, they persist and they can really hurt the wildlife you're trying to attract. Especially when it's a native plant, it's like a poison apple, right? It's like this rare thing that those animals are looking for. And when they finally find it, it actually harms them. So it's important to always inquire about the insecticides and even fungicides that were used on your plants when you plant them. We also love to stalk our butterflies. This is Pavel, and he leads the park's monarch tagging initiative, which in 2018, we tagged over 300 butterflies as they migrated to Mexico. Hopefully we'll see uh, a wave like that soon enough. Um, and in order to do this work, uh, of course, when you think about how big the park is and what we're really trying to do, we need to know which animals visit our garden. And so we've conducted bio blitzes and worked with colleges in the Natural History Museum, and as well as other entomologists who will help us look at the life cycles of the animals that are in the park and figure out how best to support them. But increasingly, we just do this work ourselves. We use iNaturalist to collect wildlife observations. And if you're not familiar with it, I just can't re recommend it highly enough. It is Maybe I think one of the most important technical developments of the modern age. I think it's just incredible. It's one of these apps where you take a photo of literally any organism and not only does it identify you, identify it for you, but it holds it in a database where you can look at populations. It's amazing. Um, so then we look at our iNaturalist um, observations in the park and then move them over into databases, which allow us to research all of these various life cycles and plant relationships so that we can better shape our garden practices around them. And we're absolutely thrilled that these are now on our website where you can easily download them even though they're still really rough, they're working documents, they're always getting updated, but they have a lot of really helpful information. And then the fun part of course is when we take that collected ecological information and translate it into gardening practices. This is what it looks like. This is what one of the databases looks, looks like. It's super zoomed in. Um, it is absolutely massive, but there's a lot of really good information there to work with. This is Bella. Um, she's the gardener of the flower field and she's holding a small carpenter bee who was a stem nester that we found during a survey. And we worked with Heather Holm um, uh, to figure out what types of stems they look for. And it's amazing to see how common this is now. Of course, it's, we cut them back to 80 to 18 inches if they have a 1 8 of an inch pith, um, because that's obviously what the bees are looking for. And again, this isn't a look for every single garden, but for us, I think it's gorgeous and it actually looks better than a clear cut. And it's our job and really everyone's job to make these aesthetics more acceptable. We also know that we have bumblebees in the park and we love them. They're the teddy bears of the insect world. And most of our bumblebees prefer to nest and hibernate at the base of bunch grasses like this little blue stem. And if you look all the way over on the left, that's a not cut back little blue stem. And if you look all the way over on the right, that is a classically cut back little blue stem. It's like we make these little meatballs. And then in working with this amazing entomologist, Jared Fowler, he told us how many of our, our bumblebees are actually nesting at the base of these bunch grasses. They're right underneath that little skirt 
of grass blades down at the base of the plant. And we do need to cut back these plants, otherwise they'll rot or even literally create a fire hazard. So we do need to cut off that top um, section of, um, they're actually flower stems. So we cut those off, but we, what we do is we leave the skirts on. We leave that whole area around the base of the plant and we try not to step there also while these bees are asleep. So we're not stepping on the bees. So getting our work done, trying to also create habitat for these adorable little guys. And this is really important because two years ago, Pavel confirmed that we have the great golden bumblebee in the park, which is an S1 critically imperiled animal in New York state. And it is amazing that this rare bee lives in the middle of the biggest city in the country. And not only does it live here, but it actually likes cities. This is from iNaturalist. This is some of the cool information you can find on iNaturalist. This is the distribution for this one bee, Bombus ruvidus. And if you look at New York City, there's like a high concentration of this bumblebee there and in Philly as well. And it's just fascinating, you know, there's a new paper coming out that cities might act as safe havens for pollinators like Bombus vervitus, who are very sensitive to the pesticides used in suburban and rural areas, as well as diseases from agriculturally managed bees. Which is fascinating because we're so used to thinking of cities as ecologically destitute, which is simply not true, we're just very different, and we can even be a refuge for certain species. We're also totally thrilled that Pavel found the blueberry digger bee uh, this spring, and they feed their young almost exclusively on the pollen of blueberries. And they're not super rare in general, their populations are doing fine, but they are very rare in cities. And blueberries are very rare in cities, as are acidic, sandy soils that they both like to live in. And so this is a real win for us because it says, we can host animals and plants that normal city habitats can't. This is a specialist dynamic. That's always what we're after. We've also found stick bugs in Brooklyn, the first stick bug uh, you know, location or uh, observation in Brooklyn. And you know, these are not super rare animals. And part of the reason why uh, we have them is because we're looking for them, right? Not a lot of other folks are really looking for stick bugs. Um, but it also shows us that we're on the right path. Rarely, we take a more heavy handed approach in our ecological management. We are overrun with praying mantises from Asia and Europe. And also there's one praying mantis from North America, the Carolina mantid. And the, it's much smaller than um, the invasive ones. And the invasive ones are just these voracious predators that eat the Carolina mantid. And then they also eat a lot of our butterflies. In the flower field, we can find um, these mantids by finding these piles of monarch wings and the mantids eating them. It's absolutely incredible. So after reading about Mount Cuba's efforts and making sure that the gardeners were comfortable with it, we started collecting and disposing of the invasive mantis egg casings. And Bella and Pavel uh, made this really helpful guide and that they're going to be publishing in the Ecological Landscape Alliance newsletter, um, I think this month, which is really exciting. And one of them, the Asian jumping mantis, Pavel read about that and he had the first sighting on iNaturalist in the Northeast. And so it's exciting to think that we could theoretically nip this guy in the bud and, and keep yet another invasive animal out of the country. Um, and, you know, it's, it's great. Um, and we've seen, we think we're not, um, we're not doing, uh, we're not trying to eradicate any of these animals, right? We're not, we don't think that that's possible and it's not our goal, but we are trying to create space for the pollinators and space for the Carolina mantids to make their, um, make their homes in the park. And so, um, we're not trying to do like, you know, real science. We like to do what we call bad science, um, just where we try in a new strategy and figure out if it works and how it works enough to use it and then convey information to other people. And it seems like this is working. Honestly, we've seen populations of the Carolina mantis just absolutely flourishing in the park. And then of course the populations of other mantids in the park are really plummeting. But of course, the hubris involved in a strategy like this can get a little dizzying. And we're not actually trying to play God or turn back the clock. We are trying to do good and minimize harm. This is a photo of the, of the Carolina mantis. Um, but of course, most of the time, we take a much lighter touch with our work. So um, as others were talking about, we want to attract ruby-throated hummingbirds. So we planted every yellow and red tubular flower native to the region. And it took five years, but I saw my first one 
two years ago and it was on a rose mallow in the flower field and I absolutely lost my mind. It was so, so thrilling. They're only stopping by in the park right now to nectar. They're not nesting in the park, but we're aiming for that as well. So these are the seed heads from Anemone virginiana, the tall thimble weed. And they're made up of these fine silks that hummingbirds use to weave their nests together with lichen and spider webs. And so we leave them up from the previous year so that while the hummingbirds are flying through, they can see that we have their nesting material waiting for them. And it hasn't worked yet, of course, but we're not giving up. We've had other really wonderful results like this clear wing hawk moth nectaring on Renarda fistulosa. We're really excited to see them on the bergamot because I am convinced that this is the pollinator partner for this plant, one of the most pollinator part, most important pollinator partners for this plant. If you read the literature, they say bumblebees, but the reproductive parts of the flower on the top there, they are nowhere near the bumblebees heads when they are um, nectaring on the flower. And when this hawk moth puts their head in the floret, it gets bopped on the head um, by this by this plant. The only other animal that's big enough to do that is a carpenter bee. And you can see that carpenter bees almost always just want a nectar rob. They want to circumvent the, the pollination of a flower and just bite a hole and drink the nectar without pollinating it. So this is really amazing, right? If this, if this dynamic is what I, I hope it is, it's really incredible that we're supporting this really important dynamic because it's what these organisms evolve to do together. And it means that the plants get to have sex. Sexual reproduction means that the plants can mutate if they're inclined, they can actually evolve literally in our park. And eventually we'll have a locally adapted strain of Monarda fistulosa, which is cool, obviously, but it's also critical for climate change and for droughts as evolving is how plants stay in one place. It's about these dynamics which are so much more beautiful and elegant, I think, than any flower or butterfly on their own. You know, people like to think of insects as being really mechanically minded, but the flowers that we all love are literally the manifested desires of their pollinator partners over millennia. They are without a doubt, the pollinators are without a doubt, the best artists this planet has ever seen. And in order to support these wonderful and beautiful dynamics, we also have the snowberry shrubs that are the host plant for those for the moth caterpillar. So we try to complete these circles. So to wrap up, I'm going to explain one way that this work happened recently, because while we don't have an official process, it really is the process that is most valuable here, because everyone is going to have different plants and animals that they're attracting, depending on where they are. And again, the real goal here is to bring people into deeper relationship with the world around them, rather than have people follow a bunch of rules. It's really about observation and connection. But one way that it happened recently is that Pavel posted a new butterfly to iNaturalist and I ID'd it as the common city wing, which is not actually that common. And over lunch one day, I research it for like two minutes and find that it's the host plant for lamb. Its host plant is lamb's quarters. And that of course is a major weed in our park and it's also a native plant. So does this mean we're gonna leave lamb's quarters and let it run all over the park? Absolutely not. We're still going to weed it in most areas and leave it where we can. But while we weed, Pavel starts looking for signs of life and lo and behold, he finds them. And so he brings these little eggs into our lab and hatches out these adorable little caterpillars and gives them lots of weeds to eat. And they pupate and eat clothes and we release them back into the park, still getting our work done, minimizing the harm of our gardening practice. We also know that we have American lady butterflies traveling through the park. So we planted pussy toes, Annapolis, their host plant so that they can reproduce here. And I can't explain how quickly the butterflies found the plants after we unboxed them. We literally had butterflies chasing a truck down a greenway to get to these host plants. This is a video of uh, us trying to plant them. And um, I'm holding this little pussy toe plant right now. And I had to sweep the butterflies off of it in order to get it um, into the ground. It was absolutely incredible to see how eager these butterflies were to find these plants. And we have maybe 10 or so, you know, similar stories for other butterflies where we figure out who is using the park 
um, and how we can support their life cycle and encourage their populations. This is that same butterfly, not the same individual, but same species. And this is them making this little cool house out of a flower, which is adorable. You just look at a flower and you're like, that's a kind of a messy flower. And you can take off the top of the flower and the caterpillar is like, oh no. And you put it back on and they go back to hiding. It's pretty, pretty adorable to have them in the park. And it's a wonderful illustration to show people you know, how this whole process works. So we're in the process, of course, of planting thousands of these host plants in the park. My not so secret goal is to have this park be just a butterfly mecca and a moth mecca um, for, so that people can come back into connection with these beautiful organisms and, and nature in general. We have over 85 acres of parkland, right? So in a city, this is just absolutely massive. So we'll see, we'll see what we can do here. And then here is a link, oops, Here's a link to our Hort resource page that I mentioned before. Hopefully someone can put it in the chat. I'll do it at the end. Um, and if you can't find it, you can just go to brooklynbridgepark.org um, and navigate to it there. And, um, and then also, if you're interested in learning more about this work, you can absolutely follow the Brooklyn Birch Park um, Instagram account. Sometimes they will post information like this. You can also follow my Instagram account. I post information like this all the time. It's what I do. Um, and also, you can go to my website and sign up for my brand new newsletter, which I really do try and pack as much information as humanly possible into the newsletter. I really try and make it beneficial for folks, as well as the science and new new science research that comes out that is tangentially relevant that might be helpful for other people developing practices like this. Um, and so if you have cool things that I should include in the newsletter, please let me know that information as well. It comes out once a month. Um, so to finish off, I just want to be clear here that the only reason that we're able to do this research and work is because of the Hort crew at Brooklyn Bridge Park, who is passionate and motivated. This is the work of a whole crew of people all working together to figure out these strategies. And a lot of this information was collected by them. And this isn't work that can be done by a contractor visit once a month. It takes time and investment and goodwill to grow these connections and relationships, which is what they really are. And the way we do that as a park and why we have this wonderful team is because we value them. And we really try to work with them to give them room to follow their interests wherever possible. Are we a perfect employer? No way at all. Uh, we are a normal place to work, but we do genuinely care and provide and try to provide a good place to work for people. And that sounds really obvious, but in an environment where manual labor has been systematically and strategically devalued for a very long time, it's actually pretty radical to say, these jobs are important. You are doing valuable work. We're going to pay you and treat you with respect. And I feel really fortunate to be able to say that because I've worked in environments where this was not the case, which is often, often uh, found in horticulture. And we were never able to do the sort of work that we do now because you can't order someone to chase around a butterfly, but you can educate them and inspire them and provide space for them to follow their own passions. You may wonder why we focus so much on butterflies and it's because everybody loves them. I personally happen to prefer moths, but butterflies are a gateway insect. And I believe that they so clearly and beautifully illustrate the possible functionality of our gardens. And the reality is that everyone wants butterflies around, but you just don't get the butterflies without the caterpillars and you don't get the caterpillars without the host plants. But we don't need to pick between the butterflies or the people because we get well over 5 million people in our park each year and almost none of them have any idea that this is going on because the wildlife and the people fit together seamlessly. So after all those pretty pictures, I like to end on this one. Everything you just saw was built on what was essentially a bunch of empty parking lots, which is ridiculous compared to how easy this work could happen with real soils that are part of real ground connected to existing ecosystems, which hopefully most of you have. Because no matter where you start from, we're all going to need to do more of this work as the planet gets developed and the climate changes. A lot of people say this might be mopping the deck of the Titanic, but actually it gives me a lot of hope that we can use horticulture to help solve some very serious, very big ecological problems that we all face right now. And we can do it literally with flowers. Thank you all so much. It was an absolute pleasure to present to you today.
That was amazing. That was really, truly incredible. And I, I hope everybody out there today thought the same. Um, it is, it's just stunning what you have built and I cannot wait until I go see it. And uh, I wanted to ask you, when is the best time to go out? When do you think we, April, should we start going in April or May? Hey. So one of the wonderful things about the park is that um, the infrastructure that MVVA created here is stunningly beautiful. It's not just the garden beds that are beautiful here, the, like the shape of the land is just gorgeous. If you're a design buff, it's, it's modern, it's chic, it's like, it's a lovely, a lovely park. But as far as uh, if you're really coming to see the gardens and the wildlife specifically, I would say, yeah, there's parts of the garden that look beautiful and the, the park that look incredible in spring, but it really starts to shine in summer and then fall. It is, I hesitate to say that I think it's the most beautiful fall park in all of the world, but I haven't, I haven't yet seen a park that I think is more gorgeous. Just the fall color here um, and the, the composition is stunningly gorgeous. Wow. Okay. So do you have some time to take some questions do, from, absolutely. Our, yep. from our audience? We have a great audience here today and they've been here all day and there's lots of energy. So let's see what we have. Um, uh, Barbara is asking if the park has experienced much vandalism. Um, that's a good question. Um, some, yeah, totally. It's New York City, right? This is um, very much a city park and there is of course okay. vandalism and, um, and we manage it. There's a fantastic crew of custodians and maintenance folks who, who come in and take care of it. I think some of the funnier like sort of horticulturally related uh, vandalism that takes place is that about once a year, someone tries to set free a plant in the park where we'll find like a house plant planted in a meadow or like a Christmas tree when you're rebound. And it just is so mm -hmm. hilarious to me, not only that someone thinks this is a good idea, but it just shows what people's um, ideas about nature really are. It's absolutely fascinating. Yeah. And now Catherine wants to know, for someone who wants to experience the woodland, where's the best entrance? I would say Pier 1. I think Pier 1 is the park was built, um, like the earlier sections of the park that were started over a decade ago were all the way in the north and all the way in the south. And so Pier 1 is actually the oldest, one of the oldest sections of the entire park. And so there, our trees are starting to look like real trees, right? They're starting to get big. They're maybe 30 feet tall at this point. And so um, that's really the best place to see like a forest. And, and that space, I would say, we have a beautiful spring uh, spring display on Pier 1. So that's like a wonderful, wonderful spring walk. Okay, everybody write down Pier 1. Um, so Jay wants to know, he lived in the village when um, he opened the windows in the spring, there would be a thick greasy suit over everything after an hour. How do the leaves of native plants handle that kind of assault in a city like, like Brooklyn? It's hard. I mean, not every plant can live in the city, right? Um, and uh, people say that London plane tree is such a common urban plant because literally it can just deal with that level of soot. It was found during the Industrial Revolution in Europe to be able to deal with levels of soot that we can't even dream of. Um, and so, uh, and so, yeah, there's. Um, you know, not every tree, not every, not every animal can live in the city, um, but the ones that do have, have their strategies, as yeah. do we, right? True. Um, Mitchell is asking, thanks, but how did you do it? You know, it's like, how? It's mind blowing it to is. see what it started at, yeah. you know, but it gives, I think, people that are living in urban cities and very dense environments here, like I'm in Jersey City, it gives people hope that we can turn these patches of land into something incredible. Yeah, so I think, you know, it was a huge uh, group of folks who created the park. Um, yeah. The neighborhood, when the, <clears throat> the piers were used by the Port Authority um, uh, in the 1950s, they were built. And then it was only 10 years that they were used until they fell into disuse because of the way that the industry changed. And so they were just these warehouses sitting here for decades and the city decided they were going to develop them. And the local population organized 
so that this would become a park instead of you know private development site and so this project really is the result of a community organization which i love um, but we also have a pretty interesting financial model that allows the park to exist it was to be built and to exist where the 10 percent of the footprint of the park is earmarked for revenue generation and that funds um funds both the construction and the the maintenance budget of the park which is really expensive this is an expensive park to run because each one of those piers is built on thousands of wooden pilings that go down uh through the water and into um into the, the bedrock and it's over ten thousand in the entire park and the water outside the park um used to be super polluted and it wasn't a problem. But then in the 1970s, when the Clean Water Act was enacted and the water was cleaned up, these tiny marine borers came in and started eating at the wooden pilings. And so the vast majority of our maintenance budget goes to encasing those pilings in um, concrete. And so it's just to say, that's a really long way of saying that this is a huge operation that has taken decades to create and many, many folks. Um, and then these incredible designers, right? MVVA um, do these wonderful, wonderful designs that are, are very ecological and really look at post-industrial landscapes like this one. Wow. What an incredible job, you know, for you where you must feel so lucky to have- Oh yeah. Absolutely. Right. Opportunity. It's it's it is. I definitely think I have the best job, except uh, one of the gardeners um, has a job where and some of the gardeners have better jobs, I think, but they have a there's these berms, right? Here's our here's our berms. There's this massive highway that runs along the length of the park called the BQE. If you've driven in Brooklyn, you know it. Um, and the berms, the designer is created so that they cut the sound off from the BQE so it doesn't go into the park, that the park can actually be a nice quiet park. And so we have these really big sound attenuating berms at one-to-one -one grades, which of course is really hard to garden on a steep, steep slope. And so some of the gardens have hard, some of the gardeners have a uh, rope in systems and harnesses and they get to like hang off the side of these grassy hills in a harness while they weed. And I always think, you know, that's the dream for me. That, that would be my favorite job. Um, okay, we're going to keep going here. Steve said um, he'd like to know spring is coming, you know, it's right around the corner. So when do you start cutting things back? Sure. So it really depends on the area, right? We're going to do a walk with Heather, um, our bird maven. Um, I think it's next week. And um, she's going to tell us which sections of the park have birds that nest in them and which ones don't. And so for the areas where there are birds nesting in those spaces, we, we try and cut them back now because the worst thing that could happen would be that a, a bird would come make a little nest in the park and then we would do cut back or they had you know picked a site and then we do cut back that would be very disruptive so any areas that might see birds we cut those back in march we'll cut start cutting them back in the next couple of weeks um but like everyone talks about on facebook and the areas where we don't have um we don't have those birds um, and we're really managing those sites more for pollinators and stem nesters and all of the other insects that are and other animals that are in the duff layer, those areas we cut back as late as possible. And we, we do, you know, we are always, we base it on temperatures and hitting 55 degrees for a few days in a row, but we're also looking at plant growth in those beds and thinking about when we can get into those beds without compacting the soil, without stepping on plants, and factoring all of that in mm -hmm. um, in order to make our um, our cutback schedule. So no clear and fast rules, but just a lot of information. Yeah. And Nancy wants to know if you have many ticks in the garden. No, thank goodness, but they are coming. Um, unfortunately, in New York City, they're they're slowly getting their way into the city, but they're not here yet. Where do you source your plants? Most so of them. For, for plants that we, the horticulture team plant in the park, we try to get them as local as possible. So we have a few nurseries that we work with out on Long Island, but we're also really fortunate to work with the Greenbelt Native Plant Center, which collects seed from within 150 miles of New York City and grows plants that literally evolved on this land, right? And so that is, that's our goal, that's our dream. We're always trying to find, to, to repatriate 
this land that we have, this you know, great responsibility and fortune to steward with the genetics that evolved here. That is our absolute goal. But when the, plant, when the park was originally planted, the designers were planting hundreds of thousands of plants and they were sourcing them from all over the country. And if you think about, especially a decade ago, it was really hard to find native plants. They were not as readily available as they are now. Um, and so the, a lot of the original plant material comes from all over the place. Okay, that's good. It still can be hard to find native plants. Absolutely. You know, people, especially yeah. out here in Jersey City and the Hudson County area, we have to go kind of far out to find native plants. Yep. So true. Um, yeah. So, okay. John or Jody is wanting to know: Are there info plaques placed around the garden that explain the reasonings behind the areas that you leave wild and that may not look too pretty? No. We've talked about it and we still think about it. Um, and I'm sure we'll do something at some point. But for the last decade, the park has been pretty single mindedly focused on construction. And so now that the park is done, you know, I'm hopeful that we're going to really think about um, more about education and interpretation. But the gardeners do a lot of education for folks. They're out in the park talking and we've experimented with um, educational signage as well. But it's hard, you know, even botanical gardens really struggle with the degree to which they want to mediate that experience that people are having with the landscape. Do they want to put a sign that sort of disconnects people? We really want people to have a connection. And we'll even plant like really wonderful spring ephemerals like around a corner where someone can feel like they're discovering it. Um, yeah. Because we don't want to say, you know, take this path to look at these beautiful spring ephemerals. We want people to feel those real connections that come from experiencing nature. And so it's always a balance, right? It's always a question. Wow. Do you have time for a few more? Yep, I do. Okay, great. Um, we'll keep going. Let's see what we have here. Have you noticed Asian jumping worms? And what are your suggestions to control them? Uh, it's brutal. We do have them. We found them in one section of the park. So we're trying to be conscious about spreading them around the park, but we kind of think it might just be inevitable. Um, and so there's good information online about about the worms, but not a lot of good information about how to get rid of them once you already have them. I think researchers are really desperately trying to figure out how to do that, but I haven't seen anything that's like, here's what to do quite yet. I think the focus right now is on stopping the spread um, so that we can try and minimize the harm that they're doing. Do you offer any programs to the public on how you can duplicate your work in smaller scales? Yeah, so we are, because of that funding model that I showed you, we are one of the rare, I like to think properly funded public parks uh, in the country. And and other folks might say that we're uh, wealthy as a park, but I we just have you know the resources that we need to do the work that we're doing. And I think it is an absolute crime how rare it is in the richest country in the history of the world that public parks and public services in general are not better funded for the public interest. And so we still recognize that we are in this very privileged place compared to the vast majority of institutions. And as public servants are constantly looking for ways that we can spread the resources around and share what we've learned to other institutions and other people who might have less resources, especially. And so not only is a lot of that information that we've posted online really an effort to do that and that's also why I'm here like talking to literally anyone who wants me to talk it's part of my job but a lot of gardeners in the park are also starting to lecture and again with a refocus on education um, we hope to even maybe do a um, like an educational day for other other parks in the city to learn yeah. about our techniques. And then I'm hopeful that soon we'll also post some of our, our protocols for things like mulching and stuff like that on the website as well. So keep an eye on that work page. That's where we'll post things. Oh, great. Um, okay, let's see here. I have praying mantis egg cases on my red wigs, red twigs. Based on what you showed, I think they're Chinese. Chinese mantis eggs. Should I remove them? If so, how? So uh, an easy thing to do is chop them off and then you can put them in the freezer for a couple days and then toss them 
uh, if you care to, or even compost them. Uh, we in the park, we chop them off and then uh, we'll just uh, put them in garbage bags and make sure that they go out with the trash. Some people get really dramatic and step on them. I think that's not necessary, but it's up to you. So we are having several people wanting to know more about the funding. You know, how is the, can you talk a little bit more about that? Sure, sure. Um, so it's an interesting strategy, right? It's a public private partnership and there's, it's a controversial and rightfully so strategy. Um, there's uh, Bloomberg when he was um, mayor of New York city, set up a bunch of these jewel, a few, not a bunch, a few of these jewel box parks like the High Line, where he created different funding models that were pretty experimental to see how to uh, build and manage parks that would not be possible with the amount of funding that the parks department gets. And I used to be a parkie. I worked for, I was a gardener for the parks department for years and we would build our own rakes when they broke. The level of resources that the parks department has is just abysmal. And, um, and so this was a strategy that they came up with, that Bloomberg came up with in order to build and manage Brooklyn Bridge Park where we own this land, right? And then um, these buildings that are on park property, uh, they lease the right in order to build and manage uh, their properties from us. And so they give us a payment initially of millions of dollars and then a certain sum each year in order to build a hotel or a um, really fancy restaurant or a skyscraper. There's all different kinds of buildings that look like they're kind of on the perimeter of the park. Um, if you come into the park, but they're actually in, in the park as well. Okay. Um, okay, just one or two more here. Um, I like this one. This one's from Jody. She's curious. Was this the original plan for the park that would be a host of natural and native gardens? Or was this an outcropping of a wonderful staff that was hired? I think it's a, a bit of both. Absolutely. Um, the, the park, MVVA, uh, always intended for this park to be organic. They always intended for this for the beds and the different spaces of beds to closely echo and function as natural ecosystems, like those salt marshes, right? Like they built salt marshes. It's yeah. incredible. And they even worked with ecologists. Um, some really incredible, like Stephen Handel is at Rutgers. He's um, he's a great urban ecologist. And um, they talked about, you know, which plants to use and stuff like that. So this was always, always going to be the, the function of the park we've then taken that and ran with it right like we've um rather than sort of sit on our loyal laurels and um and uh let the park just sort of function as originally designed and think about the extent of our work as design we've really started to focus on management on park management specifically and and garden maintenance right what some people refer to as maintenance and um what the effects of our practices as gardeners have on wildlife. Like, as I mentioned in the presentation, planting is a big part of it, a huge part of it, but so too are things like weeding and cutback um, mm -hmm. and all of the other practices. So we, that is absolutely the result of myself and all of us that are, are just fascinated and this is our, our life's work and just love to do this work. Yeah. Okay, so we know you have to get going. Um, I'm going to end on this one other question, and this woman wants to know if you can recommend any resources, any reading materials um, about ecological horticulture or any anything that has inspired you to go into this direction. Can you pass that on? Sure. I think um, the, the resources that I always uh pass along are like our, the resources that we try and create, right? And then um, there's other wonderful institutions like um, Larry Wiener and Associates and the New Jersey Native Plant Society, like all of, there's so many groups in Xerxes Society. I saw people posting those links um, in the chat. Like it's, it's amazing all the resources that we have at our disposal right now. And I also have a whole resource section in my newsletter for folks. Um, but as far as inspiration, um, that to me is Robin Wall Kimmer. I just love her so much. And she wrote Braiding Sweetgrass and other books as well. And I think that the thing that I find so profound about her approach and really um, is the sort of meta um, 
uh, uh, perspective that we bring to this work is the difference between a sort of uh, Western academic approach of learning about plants where we're reading books and uh, researching, you know, looking through science, et cetera. And then a more indigenous perspective, which is learning from the plants, watching them, observing them, um, seeing what makes them happy, watching those interactions. Because a lot of this information, like if you want to find a book about how to do ecological horticulture, good luck. It really hasn't been written yet. And it might not be able to be written because it's so different from place to place. There's fantastic books out there, like obviously yeah. Doug Calamy's books and um, you know, uh, Claudia West's books. And uh, there's wonderful resources, but no one's going to give you a step-by-step -step guide. Um, but it's upon each of us to go out and learn how to be more in relationship with the organisms around us and to learn from them what makes them happy, what else they need from us, and, and to be able to provide that. Yeah. Okay, well, this has been amazing. You've been really, truly incredible. And we've had an amazing day of speakers. Thank you so much, Rebecca. My absolute and, pleasure. Uh, and uh, I know Randy has a few things that she wants to say before we wrap up the uh, the day. So um, good luck to you. We'll be.